Hello there, fellow geeks and science enthusiasts. Okay, so let me show you a brief overview of my new book, Geek Physics. And I'm just going to go through some of the topics in there and why I think they're awesome. And then you can check out the book if you like it. Okay, so there's the full title. There's my name, that's me. Okay, so the first one, go ahead and try a little test. Open up Google, type in, why do astronauts float in space? And you're going to get the following, most likely, the following response. They float around in space because there's no gravity. That's essentially what it says. More importantly, that is directly from my blog. It's also in my book, that exact quote, because I wrote that. And Google picked it up. But you know what? It's wrong. It says that there's no gravity in space. There is gravity in space. So how do astronauts float around? Well, I explained the whole thing in my book, and I don't want to spoil it for you, so let's move on to the next thing. Another great question. Could Superman punch someone into space? So there's a little picture of the Earth and a guy getting thrown into space. That could actually happen. Uh, so people ask this question because Superman is just the most powerfulest person ever. Uh, and the, the interesting thing is that if you hit someone and they're moving upwards... There's actually two forces acting on them after they get punched. First, there's gravitational force pulling them down, but there's also an air resistance force. And the faster you go, the greater the air resistance force. So if you want to go really high, you need to go really fast. But that means a really big uh, air resistance force. So there's a problem there. It's really hard to get really, really high just by throwing or punching something. So is it impossible? Okay, this one is pretty much impossible. Okay, but you can still read the book. This one's a favorite of mine. There was this uh, competition to build a human-powered helicopter, and it just looks tough. It's tough, and they actually can do it. There's these human-powered helicopters. So how hard would it be to have a human-powered helicopter? Well, to do this, we could build a very simple model about how helicopters work. We could assume that they work by throwing air down. And by looking at the rotor size and the density of air, you can estimate the force needed to hover and also the power needed to throw that air down. And, and of course, that model just seems crazy because helicopters are complicated. So you can look at real helicopters versus and the power they need versus the model that I make. And you, and you actually get a very linear fit versus calculated power and real power. So that says the model could be real. And then you can use that to look at how hard it is to fly. And you could also look at the shield helicarrier and how, how that would work. I'm a big fan of Star Wars. You probably are too, if you're a geek. Or maybe Star Trek, that's okay too. Uh, so one of the things I did was to look at episode 4, 5, and 6 and kind of try to estimate the speed of these blasters that comes out of the, the blaster bolts that come out of the blasters in the movie. And you can't do that for all shots because some of them you just can't get a good value for. But a lot of them you can. And if you plot the different speeds, you, you find a giant range in speeds. Uh, so one way to show them all is to take the natural log of them and you get like a log type scale. And you can see in this plot here that they're, the Death Star shoots, it's not really blasters, but it's really, really, really fast. And then if you look at blasters from spaceships, they're pretty fast. And then there's a wide range of speeds for handheld blasters. Uh, but in general, the some of them are going around the speed of a Nerf gun. Some are going faster than that. And, and, but it's interesting to talk about why it is the way it is. That's all I'm going to say about that. But there is another Star Wars thing. Uh, here is R2-D2 in Episode 2, R2-D2 flies. And if you say he points his thrusters back like in this picture, which that's the way he flies then he should be having a forward force making him speed up. But if you plot his position versus time, which I did, you get this graph, which says he's moving at a constant speed. So how do you make these two things work? How do you make it such that he has a force pushing him forward and he's moving at a constant speed? There's one way to make it work, and I show you that. It's really weird, but I make it work. In the past, there's the, the book also includes real things. And there's a story of an airline, and what they did was take out their uh, flight manuals and replace them with iPads. And they said, we did this to save fuel because an iPad has less mass than a flight manual. 
So why does mass save fuel for a plane? So in order to do that, you need to think about how does a plane fly? And here's a little picture of air and a wing, and the wing's moving, and it collides with the air, and you get lift. Uh, so that's how, how it works. And it turns out that it takes more energy the heavier the object is, so you do save fuel. But, and money, but if you save fuel and money by replacing flight manuals with the iPads, couldn't you do other things to save money? What about luggage? They charge you $25 for luggage. I mean, what's the fuel cost for one bag of luggage? Is that a reasonable charge? So we can look at different things uh, about saving fuel for airlines. This is one of my favorite. Uh, in the book, The Hobbit, we have, okay, spoiler alert, Hobbit. Uh, Gollum, he lives in a cave and it's there's no light. So how does he see? Well, how do humans see anyway? On the left, I have a picture of Bilbo, and he has this sword that glows. And so when the, when the sword glows, light comes off the sword, and it reflects off things and enters his eyes, and he can see. But Gollum doesn't have that sword. So how does he see when, when there's nothing around? Uh, a common way people would say would be to use infrared. And here you see on the right an image of some kids, they're, they're my kids, uh, in, with an infrared camera. But that actually wouldn't work either in a cave. So how would it work? So I go through some different ideas about how Gollum could see in a cave and why different ideas wouldn't work. And so it's fun. Okay, so that's my book, Geek Physics. You can find it in bookstores. You can find it on Amazon. There is a Kindle version. I have a couple of other books you might inter be interested in. There's Angry Birds Furious Forces. It's a book, um, you know, for middle school or younger kids uh, and adults too, but it's, it just goes through a whole bunch of different physics ideas and uses Angry Birds to explain those ideas. So it's a general introduction to physics. It's not really how does Angry Birds work, which is covered in geek physics. Okay. Uh, I have another book, Just Enough Physics. It's a supplement to uh, physics courses for high school and college students. So you could use it almost as a textbook, but it doesn't have homework questions and stuff like that. So it, it's kind of meant to kind of help you along with that. And that's only in the Kindle version. Okay, so that's Geek Physics. If you like it, check it out. If you really like it, you know, share it with other people. And hope you have a great time.